Hello and welcome to another episode of The Zoo. My name is Alpha Bohaila and today I'm here with John Hall to talk about the difference between ITSM and ITIL. I myself have always struggled to understand really what the difference is. I'm just kidding. Uh, but even though people might have a pretty good idea the, what separates these two ideas and concepts, it's not always to understand how they come together. So we're going to spend the next few half an hour or so talking about the differences and the similarities and how they work together. And no one that I know is better to talk about this than my good friend, John. Welcome to the zoo, John. Good morning, Al. Thank you very much. I understand you had a long flight over, so I hope you're feeling good. Uh, yeah, the long flight wasn't so bad. It was the, the, the three and a half hour red eye from San Francisco to Chicago last night that, that can be a little challenging. But uh, doing good, doing good. We lost out there for yeah. a moment. I don't like, know yeah. what happened. I didn't do anything. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, it's, uh, when, when I come over to the US working, we, we I tend to try and do as much as possible so that I don't have to do too many of the big trips. So, yeah, I, I'm becoming quite known for doing crazy west to east red eyes and seeing customers and things on the on the east coast on the way back in, in body, if not in mind. Uh, yeah. Okay, getting okay. <laughs> Well, let's jump right into it and, 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 and start really with ITSM. And maybe you can explain to the audience what IT service management is and where it came from. Yeah, you'll find this is one of those questions you'll get a lot of different answers for. And they're probably all worded differently. They're generally the same. Um, to me, the most simple answer is that it's, it's a phrase that describes the, the managerial aspects of delivering IT. And, and that's a broad term managerial because I think it includes both you know, the front end customer facing elements, you know, managing their issues, managing the, the general experience that, that IT's customers, which could be internal people, could be external people have, but also managing the back end governing and processing. So you see, even then I've turned a simple answer into a complex one. Uh, I tell themselves, they, they have a, a definition that it's, I, I had to scribble this on a note because it's, it's, it's got long words in it. The, the implementation and management of quality IT services that meet the needs of the business. Again, it's quite say, say that again. The implementation and management of quality IT services that meet the needs of the business. I did it without my notes. I should have just been confident there. Yeah. It's actually not bad when you listen to it carefully. No, um, but one of my favorite, you know, when I, I had a quick look online to see what other people were saying. And, and Stephen Mann, who's a you know, an old uh, an old acquaintance of many of us, an old friend of many of us. He he worked for Forrester. He, he he's worked for various companies in the industry, uh, and he he has a page, you know, exploring the definition of ITSM. And his, the point he makes on his blog is he finds five or six different wordings of pretty much the same thing. I, I think you know, generally that that ITIL answer is pretty good. Yeah. Well, you have a new a new, not so new, but you have a young child at home. Mm -hmm, indeed. Uh, well, is it a boy or a girl? He's a boy, a little boy. Right, just, I should know this. Uh, just over two. When right. he's 10 and he asks, Daddy, what is ITS and what would you say? Because <laughs> now we're talking to my level, okay? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you see, this is one thing that preys on my mind because my, my dad was a, a ferry captain. He drove a big ship, so that was easy, you know, and a, a lot of the kids at school had dads in that industry or, or mums in that you know, a, a, it was a coal mining area, and that was pretty clear as well. It, it, it does interest me that I've spent you know twenty odd years now working in ITSM. What have I actually been? You know, how would I explain what we've been doing? But but it's actually been really cool because we, we've you know a lot of us have been lucky enough to kind of move from you know move through this 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 development of ITSM into a I think a very very credible, well thought out profession. Whereas 20 years ago, a lot of this stuff was being done completely ad hoc. It really was sticky notes on desks and, and you know, rows on spreadsheets and, and having to know who to call to get anything done. So, yeah, whether I would be able to hold a 10-year-old's you know, attention in that conversation compared to my dad drives a ship, I don't know. But it's, it's been pretty, it, it's, 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 it's been actually a really interesting time to watch IT develop. Yeah. Now, when I explain at home to my daughters, I say, you know, all those computers. Yeah, I'll make sure they run, and then I leave it at that. <laughs> and, and and I think that's something to that. Uh, although God knows it's com way more complex. And when I first got into ITSM almost a decade ago, um, I did not know how deep it was. And 
And that's when I stumble upon, which will take us to the next topic, ITIL, that, that framework that we rely on or some of us rely on to manage IT in the enterprise. So tell me a little bit, what is ITIL? Where did that, it's a British invention, right? It is, it's a British export. Can you believe it? There are, it sometimes feels like there's not that many of those anymore. ITIL, although I, I, you can track this kind of thinking back past ITIL, you know, IBM in the in the 1970s had a, were developing an internal methodology about managing IT systems, and and then they published something in about 1980 um, called the Informa Information Systems Management Architecture. So that it's I, I till I, I think it's fair to say built on some of the work that was done by companies like that that were really starting to think you know hey we we should have more formal thought through ways of dealing with all this technology that's starting to sprawl around the business. I mean, it wasn't sprawling in the 1970s like it is today, but nevertheless, you know, there was a almost an industrial revolution on the horizon. In fact, I'd argue it probably has been. Yeah. The British government then, you know, in, through the civil service, started to encapsulate this in their own way. And, and so ITIL really kind of came along later in that decade, later in the 80s in its first nascent form. By the time I got involved, I, I, I started work out of university in 94. ITIL had really been, it was on version two, and it had started to form up into quite a credible and understandable set of disciplines, 10 disciplines in two broad areas. And and that really became a success. It, it really, you know, it, it, it gave people an answer to something I think they were really looking for, which is how do we stop putting post-it notes on our desk when someone calls us with a, with an issue, you know, how do we stop having to understand which person we have to talk to to get something done in a, in a backend system? And importantly, how do we stop changing things in, you know, making changes in IT that wipe out our systems and, and start hurting people? And, and it really rolled out from Britain in, in rough, around about the mid nineties. Uh, I think that I read somewhere and I'm, I'm not sure if it's true, it wasn't really possible to quite to validate this, but that the first ITIL classes were taught in America in 1995. So it took quite a while because yeah, the whole wasn't there's some kind of one of our viewers is talking about the, the CCTA, the Central Computer and Telecommunication Agency, being part of the government's yeah, attempt that's... to centralize all this, uh, um, and to, that was in the 80s, and it took till the 90s before it reached America. So I, yeah, that that's and, unless anybody can tell me I'm wrong on that one, that yeah. that's that that seems to certainly been the case. I mean, back then I wasn't working for an American company like I am now, so it's a little. We had a working for a British company that was very very bought into ITIL from from that time in the mid '90s. So so I had an interesting perspective. We kind of grew everything up from scratch. You know, we we, we talked about uh, progressing through. A status we call control status to through to starting to develop processes. Someone described control status as understanding where on earth we are now, but but yeah, and and, and uh, there were some quite pioneering companies. You know, I worked for a company that had spun out of British Telecoms, so it had the connection back to the UK civil service because BT was only really privatised in the eighties. Yeah, and then suddenly this quiet, you know, the, the, this this quiet department in the the UK civil service had created something that went truly global. Truly, truly global. I mean, it's, it's as we'll, I'm sure we'll talk about it. It's not the only game in town and never was, but it really did become, I think, in the collective consciousness of the ITSM industry, the most widely recognized and used standard framework. And ITIL is a set of books. I flipped through them. And if anyone has insomnia, I strongly recommend it. It's amazing reading. Um, and, but it doesn't really tell you how to do things, but it does give you recommendation how to how yeah. processes should be followed or somehow. Um, yeah, and, and there's different, I always think there's different levels of, of framework and you know, structure that, you know, so some things are very, very up high, very up in the air, you know, these are these are goals that we want to achieve, these are ways of doing them. I, I think sometimes things like, you know, ISO, there's an, a standard called ISO 20,000, which is not dissimilar to you know, ITIL, but probably sits at a slightly higher level. It's more these are sort of goals, these are rules of engagement. And ITIL can plug in quite neatly to that. You have other standards which are very, very prescriptive. You know, this, this is exactly how things are done. ITIL I've always thought of as being somewhere in the middle. You know, that, that 
it, it absolutely doesn't tell you everything you need to do, but a lot of organizations will, you can map people's job titles to things in the ITIL books very easily. You know, the change manager, the service desk manager, the availability manager, all these different roles that fit very squarely to ITIL disciplines. And those disciplines, they, they, they can act, I, I see them as acting as a little, little like a job description for each of those jobs. That, that, that's how it manifests itself in, company, in, in organizations a lot. So yeah, it, it, it's not 100% prescriptive, and you don't really have to do it all or do it quite to the letter, but it's more than just a you know, kind of aspirational high-level framework as well. So how do they work together? Is ITIL the recipe and ITSM are the produce, or how does this work? Yeah, that's, a, that's an interesting question. I mean, I, ITSM happens to some extent anyway. Whether it happens badly or well, I, 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 you know, it, it depends, but... I remember talking to a customer a couple of years ago who said something which really resonated, which is that if you ask my management, we don't do problem management yet. We haven't done, we, we're doing ITIL adoption, ITSM adoption, we do incident management, we do a bit of change management, we don't do problem, that's what they'll tell you. But we do do problem management because there are always blocks of incidents sitting in our queue that have been there a long time all around the same subject because nobody, you know, something has to happen to fix them that takes time to plan and manage and someone has to work out what that is. So actually we're doing problem management. It's just, we're not officially doing that part of ITSM. That's interesting. I spoke to someone who was saying they're putting in a big effort to do more knowledge management mm. and the whole KCSM, whatever. And, um, and then, so, so you use this for problem management and I said, no, I'm, no, we don't. I said, but really, your document is the problem, and you're solving them long term this way. And they go, oh, we never thought about that. We're actually doing both. So it is very incestuous, the whole ITSM framework and ITIL uh, underlying yeah. framework. So, so, how they work together, I mean, it, it depends how consciously you're making them work together. Hmm. Um, you, you, you know, everyone who's delivering IT to a business is having to manage it in some way and, 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 Really, I think ITIL has been a way of uh, of making you know, com componentizing things in a little way, understanding what you're doing, and, and understanding how things need to work. You know, should ideally work together to put a little bit of structure around something that otherwise would be happening, but happening in a very chaotic way. So, if I try to put change management in place, do I start while looking at ITIL and understanding what the the concepts of change management is before I just turn on whatever vendor solution I have running at home. I think a lot of people will do that, but mm -hmm. it's, maybe this is the product manager me, product manager in me. I, I, I think we should start from the problem and, and work inwards. Uh, but what you've just described, I'm sure happens a lot. I think ideally something like change management is quite an intrusive process to people's roles. If you don't sell it right, you know, mm -hmm. I, I, as a, I've, I've run systems and it, the, the easiest thing in the world, hey, we've, we've got to change, you know, something needs to change in the system, let's just do it. And and having to then instead be told, no, I, I can't just do it, I have to log a request to do it and explain myself and justify myself potentially to a room full of other people. And then I might get permission to do it, but when somebody says it's okay to do it. So, so if you start from that kind of process end, it can feel quite prescriptive to users. So I would start ideally by saying, look, we have had, you know, let's, let's make some numbers up. In the last year, we had a hundred major system issues. And, and this is something that is almost certainly the case in, yeah. in most organizations. If you take a hundred things, 90 of them were caused by somebody changing something yeah. that had unforeseen consequences. I mean, there's probably another 10 that, you know, you, you can't quite account for the, the contractor on the building site next door putting a cable through a, a digger through a cable all the time you can plan around it and that, that's what comes into other areas of, of ITIL but, but if we're just talking about change management it, it's it can be a tough sell and 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 so starting with the the problem there is a problem you know, we have a problem failed changes are a major problem if you look out if you pick up the newspaper read the paper see the latest major outage in an ATM network or an airline or whatever usually it boils down to a failed change it, it, all, it always is. It always is. I mean, yeah. you've got Exp oh, Expedia is not running. Well, oh, we had an uh, upgrade last night and it didn't go well. Absolutely, it's, it's, yeah. It's an upgrade. Variable, yeah. And, and, and it's usually spun in the media, you know, and un unforeseen consequences of an upgrade or, exactly, yeah. or you know, a, a patch that went wrong. Yeah. 
so, and 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 so so that's how I think with all these disciplines, you, you the the best practice, the, the most successful organizations have understood why they need to do this, and they've sold that very well because it is a cultural change for people. Yeah, change management is a great example of one that needs serious cultural change, and yet the benefits really, you know, ultimately there's a big benefit in that those people who want to do that change system will probably find themselves on call less on a Friday night facing their whole weekend being wiped out by by a big system restoration. It will maybe not ever go away, but hopefully there'll be a lot less of it. And you know, as somebody now with a two-year-old boy, I've, I've seen uh, plenty of people who also have young kids in that situation facing long weekends of pain and suffering and pizza. <laughs> Um, there are other frameworks than ITIL out there, mm. isn't there? What are some of them, and, and how? Do yeah, there certainly are. I mean, I, I've mentioned ISO twenty thousand, which isn't mm. necessarily it's not mutually exclusive. What is that? It's it's a like all these ISO things. It evolves from you know from again quite often government based standards bodies. So it, it is a set of it's like a lot of other ISOs. It's a defined set of certifiable standards that. I think another one, it actually came out of the British Standards Institute. We, we seem to, it's the one thing we, we import is that, then fair enough. Well, um, it's, you, you always have, from the olden days, you came up with the meters and well, the yards and all this. You, you did help us, especially after the Enlightenment era, uh, help us standardize and you just can't stop doing so. I'm not sure that, and these days I'm not sure oh, that. There's Americans who would never be the one who standardize everything. <laughs> <laughs> I always thought the imperial measurement system was actually a, cruel practical joke played on the world that went a little bit wrong if one took it a bit seriously, but yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> but so ISO 20,000 is an interesting one. There, there are some other frameworks. I mean, we often see, see COBIT, which mm. is much more of a kind of operational governance focused framework, but again, there's huge similarities with ITIL. So sometimes it can be quite a challenge sitting the two things together, mm. but ultimately they're doing a little bit of, you know, the, 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 the general intention is the same. We see, we work with a lot of telcos, of course, and, and there's, you know, for a, at least as long as ITIL, I've been working with ITIL, there's been ETOM, a, a telecom operations management standard. And that, that again, it's, it's, it's intentions are broadly similar. It's a little bit hard to map one-to-one -to, -one to ITIL, and, and ETOM is a lot more focused on telecom service offerings and the management of those. But, but often, as that kind of equipment converges as more and more telco stuff is just basically computer stuff that there, there's there's more and more companies looking at aligning those two and and then actually it's fair to say you know i i till right now is in a bit of a transitional phase because the industry is transit tra you know, is transitioning so fast you know with, with what's happening there well, how, well i've already mentioned the telco you know the, the fact that so much telco stuff is now ip enabled so suddenly there's there's collisions of standards from two industries that need to figure out how to work together you've also got a, a big shift you know, pick another you know another big change there's so many big changes going on but one very fundamental one is the move towards much more continuous delivery of of software mm -hmm. continuous development continuous delivery and and that i've seen creating some interesting cultural challenges in ITIL organizations where you know the, the change process typically has a lead time of maybe days or a week from logging the change a minimum lead time between logging the logging a significant change at least uh, and executing it mm. and, and approvals in the middle but now we see companies like amazon deploying you know 20 000, 30 000 changes to their code a day and maybe it's even more than that now in production yeah. um and and well, facebook you know and of course they're at the leading you know they're, they're right at the, 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 the other edge of things they built that entire culture from the ground upwards. Right. But it's very, very common now for me to, I was a, went to visit a big travel company in the UK last week and they have a separate department, almost a separate business unit in their IT organization. So they, they have, it's very much an example of what Gartner are calling bimodal IT. They have the, the more traditional is a bit of a loaded word, but I'll use it. They, they have that kind of more traditional IT setup, but they also have this very, very agile team that is designed for rapid innovation, rapid delivery. And now they're figuring out how to amalgamate the two together. So ITIL itself is, is almost, in, I, I, I'll use the word pressure. I mean, I, I, if you go to a kind of DevOps continuous development conferences, which I, I, I occasionally pop in on because it's very important, I think, to, to follow that trend, you can certainly get this notion that ITIL is something in the way amongst that community. Um, 
but then some of the real big founders of that movement, like Gene Kim, who wrote the, the Phoenix Project, have written plenty of things saying, no, ITIL is not incompatible with this. It's mm. just, you have to just map it in a slightly different do way. You, do, you, do you see or do you know if ITIL will, because will it evolve with this rapid development? And rapid is an understatement. Yeah. <laughs> it's like it went from one release every three months to well, a thousand every month. So, uh, you know, how... Yeah. It absolutely has to evolve because this is the reality. This is this is how a lot of software is going to be delivered. There's, there's a you know we, we see a big shift now towards in this digital enterprise. You know companies are going to differentiate themselves mm. by writing their own software at the point of their front end delivery or consuming much more innovative software and doing things quickly. Mm. And and so it has to evolve. And and we're now seeing you know, there's, there's an interesting framework that, that's being that's out there and being worked on by a lot of the same people who seen in the ITIL space over the years called IT, IT for IT, which is more, I, I think, to me, it seems more, it takes a lot of the ITIL principles, but it puts them more in a kind of continuous structure. It's more about planning, building, delivering, running. And, and you know, I think being able to establish that in a very parallel way mm -hmm. across different services will, will help bring these ITIL principles to the new world. How this pans out, I'm not sure. I mean, we, we certainly still hear about ITIL all the time. But if you talk to Gartner, and you know, I've had Gartner people say they get a few less calls now about ITIL and more, and many more calls about well, these calls aren't asking for ITIL, they're asking for something different. And, and I, I think we, we're going to spend a few years in the industry either evolving ITIL or having to figure out something new. I think probably, I think ITIL can and will evolve. There's a couple of other things I want to talk about, but before, while we're on this topic, the, 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 the latest, the, the new kid on the block is C Siam, uh, mm. service integration and management, whatever. Yeah. And Where does that fit? Yeah. Yeah. So Siam is, is we, I, think, I, I think it sits somewhere towards doing everything in house and have, and the total outsourcer model that you know, when, when we saw, you know, a decade ago, a, a decade ago, a huge number of companies outsourced almost everything, mm. handed everything over to a you know service integrators and providers, who generally speaking were very very built around ITIL. In my experience, yeah. and they they could use ITIL as a way of selling their services. Hey, you can buy change management offers, you can buy problem offers, which worked good for them, good, you know, I think. But again, maybe because of this need for companies to be differentiating themselves at the technology front end, at the line of business, mm. a lot of those companies are pulling everything back in house again now, that the pure outsource model is not, is not being very successful at the moment, in my, in my opinion. And so Siam is a bit more- Why not? What is it? Do you... Well, you've got no control. I mean, if, if, if your company, in a nutshell, if, if, you need, if, if you've decided that you want to be that great new you know, digital company, and, and you know, don't forget, we, we see now, we, we interact with very traditional companies in very new ways. You know, I, I, like, like we said, I, I flew on a plane last night. I didn't touch a piece of paper. I did everything on, on you know, from the moment the ticket was booked on our on, on our travel system at work, mm. which could do with a little bit of, you know, a little bit it's of- The lipstick, yeah. No. <laughs> never mind. But but from that moment, you know, I, I've got the United Airlines app, so United, I, I, I flew, I'm, I'm flying home tomorrow night on a 767 that's probably 24, 25 years old. Mm. You know, that, that is definitely legacy technology. I, I'd like to tell myself if it's been up that long, it must be pretty good. Um, but I do everything on a mobile phone app that's really nice. You know, I, I, I can change my seat. When I hit that change my seat button, let's think there's 50 different IT systems have just been touched in one click there, but all I have to do is one click. Mm. And, and then, you know, I, I can get my boarding pass. I can review my frequent flyer stuff. I can request an upgrade. I can even see, you know, for that plane, what, what's going to be on that plane? Is there going to be Wi-Fi? Is, is there going to be, you know, is there going to be entertainment? So, so all that stuff is a very different and differentiating experience. You know, that, that, that is a company that is changing from an airline company to a airline and software company. And, and right across vast ways of the industry, across vast ways of every industry, the companies are having finding that, that this is the new expectation. You know, we're all walking around with little supercomputers in our pocket that are really lovely to interact with, and we want to deal with companies that way. So, um, there's a long answer to a short question, yeah, I know, but, but the um, so the challenges for companies if we've outsourced everything, how do we 
what, what can we do? How, how do we do that? You know, we, 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 we could pay someone to build that app, but then we're in a long development cycle. So, so the general trend has been for people to pull a lot of this back in house and, you know, out, outsource the stuff that isn't really core to their business, but bring in house those things that is. And that kind of moves us towards Siam where they may still be paying an outsource integrator company to manage things, but the company's not managing everything. They're managing different towers of service. You know? So I, okay, I'm an airline. I don't want to do networking. I'll outsource the networking. I do want to do application development. I'll bring that in house. I, maybe I want to retain my own customer service center, but I will outsource some of the other elements of, of operations. So all these things that do fit together in an ITSM environment are now a mishmash of internal and external. And the Siam provider is, is the, the body that is in charge of pulling that into a cohesive, a cohesive form. So again, it's not incompatible with ITIL by any means. And ITIL has always talked about defining services and understanding them and managing them. Well, and that's actually an interesting point. So ITIL, it is a large framework. Do I, two things, do I have to take the whole enchilada or can I just pick and choose what I need as I evolve my uh, IT service management? And in implementing I, or bringing ITIL in as the underlying framework when I manage um, the digital enterprise today, does that bring on a lot of changes, cultural changes and so on? So. Yeah, you don't. You certainly don't have to do everything all at once. And, and no company, I don't think anybody, but they ever be successful trying to launch into all you know nearly thirty ITIL disciplines at once. And really, the the classic kind of evolution path into this is to start at the service desk. Mm. And I think partly that's the most custom visible thing, but also it's often where the most pain, the most obvious, immediate, addressable pain is. Mm -hmm. And then from once once you. You know, once companies have established a good degree of control and formalized the service desk, they start moving then maybe into either problem or change management because, you know, as you said, problem is going to be happening anyway because you're going to have blocks of tickets that are just sitting there with somebody needing to proactively manage them. Change is about reducing a lot of the risk that leads to those incidents. So that's quite a logical path. And then and then it really depends where companies want to go. I mean, they're, they're, you know, if, I think often things like availability management come in, configuration management, these things that are about understanding and getting the best out of the actual infrastructure that provides these services. And around that, around those things, as those are evolving, the very notion of defining what are our services, you know, the understanding the portfolio, what do we, we do all this stuff, how do we divide that into understandable services that we can, we can manage? And, and so that is often an evolution over a couple of years. Mm. And then really you know, with that with that framework in place, we see we often see companies then really start branching out and, and, and formalizing the rest. But to be honest, it's I, I think it's quite rare to find someone who would tick every single box in ITIL and say, Yeah, we do every single one of these. Yeah. I think that would be a, a, an edge case. And, and it's not an overnight change, so there isn't a major disruption for the end user, the employers or the customers and so on. Yeah, it, needs, it needs significant backing from management because we are asking people to do things in a different and more structured way. Yeah. Say that classic example of you know, change management where suddenly I can't just go and do the stuff I'm good at doing. I have to go through a government process. I mean, it, without management oversight and frankly, serious disincentives to still go and do your own thing, uh, that that can't establish. So so the cultural change has to come right from the top of this. You talk to a lot of enterprises, um, and some of them are using ITIL, some of them are not, some are using a little bit. Is there success correlation to using ITIL? If I start to implement it, if I'm sitting and watching this and I'm on the fence and we're doing a little bit of it but really want to get into mm. it, is it worth it? Will it help me over the long term? Yeah, definitely. I mean, that, that's that's un, unquestionable. We we see, and and again, you know, it's there, there's so many there's so many stories and 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 different objectives that people have set out to do. But if you look at things like the the results on the frontline service desk, it's mm -hmm. very very common for a really good ITIL program to 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 actually you know generate demonstrable results. In I, I like to think of customer satisfaction is probably the first thing to think rather than numerative measures like number of tickets but 
nevertheless, we we, we sold a hundred tickets more this month, but people don't like us. Yeah, well, oh, the thing is, I mean, there's actually uh, one thing I have seen is a unintended consequence. When the service desk gets better, it suddenly starts taking more tickets because people are actually more willing to call something they think is going to do something for them. So yeah. pure managers like that are not always great. But on the other hand, we we have a a story on our website about a you know, a large company in China who halved the number of incidents and halved the time to resolve those incidents with a structured ITSM program. Mm. So that's that's double good. You know, there's not just a good number outcome. Things are being fixed quicker. You can't you can't hide behind the, the time to resolution. Yeah, that's good. People so, and you know, we the, the examples that we often see. You know, typically change management will reduce failed changes considerably, you know, forty percent or more, which is a, a vast difference to 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 the impact that that kind of problem has on the company. Yeah. Um, so there's, there's, we've got a number of stories on our website and, and lots of other people, consultancies and vendors in this space too. And, and it, it's one of those things where there's no guarantees. You can't just plug in a tool, switch it on, walk away and leave the stuff with it and assume that's going to change everything. Tools are part of the process. Management, oversight, governance are all part of the process done well it very, very frequently shows good results. Yeah. Well, with the explosion of online services and online shopping, and, and I live in a remote area where we don't have shopping, but I have two teenage daughters. So trust me, FedEx and UPS come <laughs> every day, every day. Um, my wife, who does most of the shopping, doesn't pick stores or service providers based on their offerings. It's one thing and one thing only, their customer service. So if they have can process her requests if they don't know her information if they can't offer um, her notification on a mobile phone she's not buying with it simple as that right and, and so and there's very, very few we can do that and as you said that's not that easy to do because you know it, for, for the end use it looks like there's one system one web page behind that web page are 10 15 systems hooked together maybe more systems hooked together and then you have the outside suppliers on the so having something as old and stoogy as ITIL come back and actually have almost a, uh, a comeback, if you will, and, and become more than just this library, uh, but actually becoming um, a religion to some, to some is, is, seems to be a necessity if we're going to enter into this digital enterprise because we can't wing it. You know, We have to do it properly. Um, there's nowhere to hide from that feedback anymore either. No. The, the, so one of the big... Big growth areas in, in IT, ITSM right now is customer self-service and enabling that kind of one click. You know, I, I don't want to, as a customer, no, no more do I want to fill out something that looks like my tax form just to to say that. Even your tax form right. don't look like your tax form. You can no, now do your you taxes. <laughs> yeah. now, now you want to hit a button, you know, the, yeah. the, that Uber type experience where I, I used to have to fill in four pages on a web page to book a taxi from our San Jose office. And now if I wanted, I could just hit a button and, and get an Uber. Yeah. So the, and, and the other thing is the feedback is so vocal now. You know, we, we you, you mentioned looking at services. You know, how how many of us ever book a hotel anymore without checking something like TripAdvisor just to make sure it's not a horror show? It's 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 one of the things that service organisations really. That's why I'd like. I'm always advocating focus on metrics like this. The end result, like customers, is customer satisfaction. It's not just a counter. Hmm. That. That, that's an area that really, really is growing within ITSM, that, that provision of a really great customer experience. I think it reflects in, it, we, we've aimed to reflect that in the tools we're building. We take a product like Remedy and we focus entirely now on the customer experience, the user experience, and that drives what we do with the tool. It, it, that, that in, in, in you know, whatever else happens to ITIL and ITSM, I think that area can only continue to get more important. Yeah. I think you're right. Well, thank you, John. It's been a real pleasure talking to you about ITIL and ITSM. I didn't think it was going to be this fun until that much. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it's always great to have you in the zoo, so thank you. Brilliant. Thanks very much, John. For the rest of you out there, take care. Be safe. Bye-bye.